think we, we are going to break, uh, go for a break, but we have time for three questions. How about that? So I invite the panel quickly, and if you can put those three questions up. Thank you very much. So I feel like the, each question will go to our respective speakers. So Ash, you want to continue and answer the first question? Sure. sure. Should pulmonary hypertension diagnosed by echocardiogram be confirmed by cardiac catheterization before initiation of treatment? I think that's a great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, yes, is the answer because um, without diagnosing PAH, the only way to diagnose PAH is by a right heart cath uh, catheterization. Now, echo can give you clues if the patient, you know, patient has a left heart disease. I didn't touch upon it in this talk, but uh, you know, if the patients have left atrial enlargement or um, uh, you know, uh, left-sided diastolic dysfunction, you can get clues on the echocardiogram, but they're just clues. For um, confirmation, all these patients should get a right heart cath. So just to add, clarify, how do you monitor those patients? Do you have to do repeat echo or do you just repeat cath them? So most of the times uh, we uh, monitor them with symptoms uh, and echocardiogram. If they are not responding as we want them to, then they will get a repeat right heart cath. Right. Jerry, how long can a patient survive with an LVAT as destination therapy? So that's a great question. And there are now several patients across the country that are more than 10 years out. Um, now, I, I can tell you we're, the, these devices were approved for destination therapy back in 2009. Those that had been on more research devices, or namely the HeartMate 2, are, are doing well. It's all about more how well the patient is on the front end, or they're all sick enough to justify an LVAD, but it's the comorbidities it keeps, technology is improving, we think these pumps can last for a long time. So one year survivorship on average, we look at Intermax around 80%, out to th three years, that does drop a little under 70%, but more and more around 65%. And so this experience in terms of long-term survivorship is um, growing, but it's still not what we observe with heart transplant mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, 55%, including those within a year, uh, that, that don't survive within a year, make it to 10 years. So wow. it's improving um, as, as technology improves. I'm hoping that will get better and that gap for individual patients that have a lot of comorbidities is narrowing compared to transplant. So great question. So can, can you, what is the longest a patient with LVAD has survived for you? I think they're now at about 12, 13 years. Um, I think in the world. Mm -hmm. So in our patients, we have 165 patients that are in the community living with an LVAD. And we have several that are over five years out. Great. Yeah, Thank I think you. the longest that we have was eight and a half years. At our institution. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I think the next question is designed for Dr. Park. I think it's Dr. Park's typical office patient. <laughs> So what do you do if a patient has the following side effects, other than referring to Dr. Park, if the patient has side effects of ACE, ARBs, he's on beta blockers, blood pressure is still high, has CAD with what? one stand, bad kidneys, and hep B. Oh my, okay. So uh, um, with ACE cough and, and have some uh, sort of angioedema, I mean, you can uh, use that class of medication. They're on beta blockers, that's really great. Um, hypertensive with CKD, I mean, I would uh, add ACE uh, hydralazine and, and, and nitrates to this patient and probably try to get the blood pressure more, more within the range where it would be more favorable for, um, to, uh, uh, for um, her for to reverse some of the remodeling process. So probably that would be my next target. I'm assuming this patient has low EF, which was- I imagine so. Yeah. I, I kind of took that for an assumption. Are there any preferred antihypertensives in patients with CHF? Which are your first line of drugs? I mean, it would be ACE inhibitors, ARBs, those, for those who cannot tolerate it. Okay. What about isodil and... Uh... So for nitrates, um, um, again, uh, for patients that are African-Americans and if they have blood pressure, we, we add um, hydrolysis and isodil combination. Uh, for those with uh, CKD and, or hyperkalemia where that is not uh, useful, then we go to, we jump to uh, hydrolysis and isodil combination. There are some folks who, because of headache and other side effects, cannot tolerate it and isodil 
to do um, or nitrates, and then we just use try to use optimize and hydrolysis alone. Not as not proven as as um, a, a combination for um, neuro hormone antagonists like other therapies, but again, um, something that has been found to be useful. Just one last quick question: If somebody has low EF, which is your preferred beta blocker, and why? Um, I was well, so I okay, so I think it would depend on the person. If if you have um, somebody that has a, a stable blood pressure, um, I use carbidolol uh, and then initiating a three point one to five and titrating them up um, and and following their blood pressure and their symptoms. If they start with a marginal blood pressure but they're otherwise stable, uh, then I use uh, metoprolol succinate. Now, if um, uh, if somebody has other comorbidities like I mentioned, like diabetic, or if they have a really uh, pretty advanced COPD where they they're on inhalers and treatments, then metoprolol may be a better choice. Great. Thank you all very much.